Hi, welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be video number five in a series devoted to getting started in existential psychology. And in this video, we're going to take up uh, two basic topics. One has to do with the historical lineage of existential psychology within the larger ambit of continental philosophy, and the other of which has to do with something that's maybe puzzled you throughout this entire series of videos, which is the question of why do all these questions have yes and no answers? Okay, so in the previous video, we talked a little bit about the tensions that tend to arise between a European movement like existentialism and our peculiarly American uh, values and habits. Uh, so in this video, uh, we're going to ask the question, is existentialism passe? And of course, once again, the answer is, well, yes and no. So uh, we need to talk a little bit about, uh, like I said a minute ago, uh, existentialism's historical lineage. Now, uh, there are any number of antecedents. Oh, well, before we get into that, I have a hat that's more or less uh, germane to this topic, so it's my old fart hat, so <laughs> which I'm wearing. You know, I'm I'm uh, graduating into a first-class curmudgeon, perhaps, and that's a manifestation of it. Okay, so at any rate, is uh, existentialism basically an old fart philosophy? That's the question of whether it's passe or not. Okay, so. Uh, speaking of the larger uh, historical lineage of existentialism, you can, of course, uh, trace uh, existentialism's roots back into antiquity, at least in terms of antecedents to existentialism proper. You can find antecedents in the form of uh, Heraclitus, to mention a pre-Socratic philosopher. Um, I mentioned uh, Blaise Pascal uh, last time, who was an Enlightenment thinker and not within the purview of existentialism the way we think about it today, but still an antecedent. Um, even there are parts of the Bible, I would say, like in the book of Ecclesiastes, is a kind of uh, antecedent to existential thinking. That might be a little bit surprising to you. But at any rate, existentialism proper began with the grandfather of existentialism, Soren Kierkegaard, which is a name that I've mentioned a couple times in these videos. In your notes, I gave you his life date, so 1813 to 1855. So we're talking about the first half of the 19th century. Uh, so um, Soren Kierkegaard, Danish. Okay, so a little bit of a departure from the usual French and German thinkers uh, in that regard. So uh, let's, let's remember what I said about Kierkegaard before. So I, I uh, characterized him as a very theistic uh, thinker and a pretty individualistic thinker, too. Okay, so we have the origin of existentialism proper in the uh, first half of the 19th century. Um, it reached its heyday in Europe. If I had to sort of name a date for that, it'd probably be uh, soon after World War II, uh, maybe around 1950 for its heyday in Europe. Now, here's the thing about how these uh, movements in philosophy propagate themselves over to the Western Hemisphere. It usually takes about... 10-ish so years for them to find their way over to the Americas and, uh, you know, North and South America. And uh, such was the case with existentialism. So the heyday here, if I had to name sort of the heyday here, it'd probably be right around 1960-ish. Okay, so that's a while back. That's, uh, you know, uh, it's about 60 years. Uh, actually, it is 60 years. So, um, the next thing you should probably know is that, um, oh, uh, one thing I should mention before we move on is that, you know, think back to what you know a little bit about history right around 1960 in the United States. And maybe one of the things that you remember from more or less that period of history, which was before the hippie era, was there were a group of sort of proto hippies in a way called the Beats and, uh, you know, famous beat poets like Allen Ginsberg and uh, beat authors like Jack Kerouac. And the thing about the beats is they were very sympathetic to existential thinking. It made a huge impression on them and they were uh, talking about Sartre's ideas and Heidegger's ideas and all of this kind of thing. In addition to, I guess, smoking lots of marijuana and writing wild poetry and 
you know, having sort of slam poetry events with bongos playing in the background and that sort of thing. It also made a big impression on humanistic psychology, which of course was uh, in its nascency right around then. So, uh, okay, so now the next thing we should mention is that uh, since its heyday, uh, which I'm localizing right around 1950, it's approximate, okay, uh, in Europe right around 1960 in the United States, it's been superseded by several movements within continental philosophy and most notably uh, post-structuralism, I guess, would maybe be the most famous one, but also uh, deconstructionism, which is a mode of philosophy particularly associated with Jacques Derrida, and uh, postmodernism. Um, many thinkers in the postmodern uh, pantheon, such as Jean Baudrillard, was quite famous in the 1990s. U2, <laughs> the band U2, wrote a song about him. He was uh, referenced in the Matrix movies and all of that, so he entered into pop culture. But there are others like Michel Foucault and Leotard and uh, um, others. All right, so. All right, so let's sort of connect the dots a little bit. Okay, so existentialism running for about 100 years, okay, from sort of early, mid 19th century to mid 20th century, roughly 100 years, and then being superseded in the latter 20th century by post-structuralism, deconstructionism, and post-modernism, kind of the triumvirate of those. And probably since that time, it's, uh, been superseded yet again by uh, modes of continental thinking that are not properly speaking post-structuralists and all of that. So uh, maybe you're getting the idea of why it might be important to ask about whether um, existentialism is an old fart philosophy, whether it's passé would be a fancier French way of saying that. Passé I guess is how you really pronounce it, but the Americanized pronunciation is probably passé. So, so why should we care about it, other than as an interesting historical artifact? Okay, that's the essential question, right? If its, if it's heyday was roughly uh, 60 years ago or even 70 years ago in Europe, if it's been superseded by a bunch of other modes of uh, continental philosophy, then why should we care about it today in the early 21st century after all these years? And I think the first uh, thing to say about that question is uh, there's really no definitive, I keep losing this chord, there's no definitive rational reason that would automatically convince you to care about existentialism. It's not really a matter of being sort of uh, convinced in an argumentative sense that there's a definitive reason to care about it. Okay, so it's a, it's a matter of, as I said in a previous video and also in your notes, uh, once again quoting Blaise Pascal, uh, the heart has its own reasons that reason knows not of. So if there's a reason to care about existentialism, I think it has more to do with the heart's reasons. Okay, so what might some of those heart's reasons be? Well, uh, the thing is that even in our a uh, very technologically mediated age of distraction is what I called it in one of my videos on my other uh, channel. Um, for some people, the riddle of existence has not lost its charm or its allure. Okay, so, um, well, why not? Because some people find it still powerful, still evocative to think in terms of uh, fundamental categories like being or like existence, right? And some people are just sort of hungry for like a real fundamental uh, radical uh, way of understanding life and making sense of life and a way that does not shy away from all of the parts of life that we find difficult and nettlesome like we described in one of the earlier videos, okay? So for some people, that kind of honesty and that kind of realism is still something compelling despite the fact that we live in the 21st century in an age where people are very often more preoccupied with uh, what iPhone they have as opposed to what kind of existence they have. All right, for some people. So probably uh, existentialism's audience at this point in history is, is a little bit on the margins, I would say. But still, for some people, man, the language of existence is an important language to learn to speak, you know? 
consciousness of our existential lot is still an important thing. And really when you think about it, like it, it is a puzzling fate for a movement like existentialism whose object was to explore and intensify our sense for what existence really is. It is an odd fate for a movement like that to be displaced rather easily uh, within, um, you know, sort of the fad and fashion of the intellectual community. Like, how is it that something that seems so central and important to our lives could be so easily uh, deflected and knocked aside by something like, you know, structuralist thought or then post-structuralist thought a little bit later or post-modernism or something like that? Like, how could that possibly occur? Well, if you want a, a bunch of detail on that, I have another video on my main channel. Maybe I should start putting links. <laughs> Maybe, okay, I'm going to put some links on the description section of this video to a couple videos on my main channel, one of which is going to go into a lot more detail about how that actually happened historically and some of the famous critical debates and uh, you know how post-structuralists conceive of the fundamental constructs of existential thinking like existence, like being, like authenticity, like I-thou relatedness, like experience for that matter. <laughs> Um, well, let me give you a, a, a spoiler. Um, basically, the way they think of all those kinds of categories and constructs is um, particular linguistic games, all right? And usually the way they think of it is particular linguistic games in the service of power and the allocation of power. So what for existentialists is like, like a bright, poetic, uh, resonant way of thinking about being is for a post-structuralist just another uh, historically and culturally conditioned set of linguistic games in the service of powers interests. Okay, so <laughs> that's a spoiler, but if you want a lot more detail about all that I'm going to put a link to a video on the description section of this video. So um, from an existential point of view, let's reverse the perspective, from an existential point of view um, really what post-structuralism and post-modernism and deconstruction for that matter is all about is uh, a kind of fadism, intellectual fadism, okay? So um, uh, if you see things from a more existential perspective like I do, I've read a fair amount of post-structuralism uh, along the way, but it's not where I personally live and breathe, okay? Like I'm conversant in it enough. I know enough to be dangerous, as the old saying goes. I know enough about it to be dangerous, and I can speak the vocabulary somewhat, and I know some bunch of the central features of a bunch of the central thinkers, but it's not where I live and breathe. Like, um, you know, when it comes down to it, I'm, I'm pretty much a a phenomenological, existential, Buddhist slash meditative type thinker, and I know that's a long hyphenated phrase, but existentialism's definitely part of where I live and breathe for sure. Okay, so it's a kind of, uh, from an existential point of view, all of these things that superseded existentialism that would make it seem passe are really nothing more than a kind of intellectual fadism. Uh, preoccupation with what's new. That's the thing about, you know, I, I almost hate to say this, you know, because I've spent so much time in academe and all that, but there is a kind of fetishism with the new. And one of my colleagues by the name of Jim Dillon gave a real apt name for it. He calls it neophilia, which is sort of like, um, it, well, from the Greek, a, a kind of a a lust for the new, like the new automatically means more than the old. And well, that seems like really just arbitrary when you think about it. Like, well, why should the new mean more than the old automatically? You know, because sometimes the most powerful, interesting truths are the ones that keep recurring throughout human history. Like, the reason why they keep recurring is because they're powerful. They speak to the core and center of what we are as participants in life, participants in humanity, and so on. But the real central question is the one that I have in your notes as I'm looking toward them. The question so isn't so much how I think or where I live and breathe, the real question for this class is going to be, how do you feel? Okay, sort of, like, where do you hang your hat? Maybe you have a young fart hat. Where do you hang your young fart hat? I got an old fart, okay boomer type hat. So, <laughs> and, um, you know, I love existential thinking. I've gotten a lot out of it, and that's how I feel, you know? And so this class is going to maybe uh, be an ongoing invitation to see if you might feel the same way, and maybe some of you will and some of you won't. That's inevitable. 
Okay, and finally, all right, here we go. We're heading into the straightaway to the finish line. So the last segment of your notes, why do all these questions have yes and no answers, okay? And um, the reason is because uh, as a corpus of thought and insight into our human condition, existentialism is not a very consistent or systematic uh, body of thought. Okay, so existentialists will often disagree with, with each other in sometimes in the most fundamental ways about the most fundamental issues. Sometimes existentialists aren't even consistent within their own body of thought, you know. So a particular existentialist will have sort of differing opinions sometimes even with in his or her own body of thought. Okay, so um, uh, here's how I talked about it in your notes. As a body of thought, existentialism is rife with ambiguity, contradiction, and paradox, and is hence an accurate reflection of existence itself. Okay, so here's the main point, right? So if you're looking, first part is if you're looking to existentialism for a, a perfectly consistent, non-contradictory, um, uh, systematically coherent body of thought, you, you're looking in the wrong place. You're, you're going to be irritated and vexed if that's what you're really looking to existentialism for. And the reason why is existentialism is trying to be a reflection of how life is, how human existence is. And the fact is that we're not very consistent, okay? We're not very consistent creatures. The existential predicament into which we've been thrown is not particularly marked by constancy or consistency over time. Uh, so existentialism, insofar as it reflects life, is also not very consistent. In fact, you could say that, you know, human existence is so inconsistent that it's not even consistently inconsistent. Okay, so let me say that again in case that wasn't obvious. That human existence is so inconsistent that it's not even consistently inconsistent. You see, like if it were consistently inconsistent, the task of describing what existence about is about would be much easier because all you would have to do is give a narrative of the fundamental inconsistency of human existence. But the fact is that sometimes we are consistent. Sometimes we do make sense over time. Sometimes we don't contradict ourselves and so on. But that doesn't make our job easier as people who are trying to understand human existence. The deeper reality is a lot of the time we're inconsistent, but sometimes we are consistent. So we're not even consistently inconsistent, but that makes it even trickier for that reason. Okay, so um, once again, like you got to get over your will to have sort of a consistent, non-contradictory uh, mode of inquiry. You know, like if you really want to sort of fathom things, you're going to have to step beyond that prison house, like at some point. So um, a little bit like, um, you know, Oscar Wilde once famously said that, well, consistency is about a lack of imagination, you know. And uh, similarly, you know, like Emerson, okay, in the United States, em well, for Ralph Waldo Emerson, okay, um, once again, 19th century American thinker, one of ours, uh, said that, well, foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds, okay? So you've got to beware of being sort of too fetishistically consistent. Like if that's your, your sort of fetish that you're getting off on, it's like, well, you know, it might not be anything more than the hobgoblin of your small mind, you know, clamoring for attention and gratification. And it's like, well, you know, maybe they're deeper and more noble parts of you, just a thought. Okay, so... And finally, the last little tidbit. So all of this begins to require something like what Piaget's students called post-formal operations. Okay, so Jean Piaget, famous cognitively oriented psychologist, developmental psychologist, who was probably the most famous theorist uh, who talked about how our cognitive capacities develop mostly through childhood. Okay, like he had it that, well, you know, eventually, if you're lucky, you'll get to formal operations, which is the ability to think in abstract, hypothetical type terms so that your reasoning is not just tied to concrete here and now type stuff. Okay, so you can, whatever, solve math problems in your head or something like that. 
PHA students had a different idea. They said beyond formal operations is something like post formal operations. And what they uh, talked about with respect to that is the ability to think in terms of paradoxes and contradictions and um, tensions within thought without just rushing automatically <laughs> like a bunch of lemmings, you know, to resolve the contradiction. Like sometimes contradictions are meant to be embraced, all right? And insofar as life is a contradictory affair, maybe that's the essential challenge. If you want to think your way into it, you might have to entertain a mode of thinking that embraces contradiction, that embraces paradox, and doesn't just sort of rush neurotically to resolve it somehow, you know, sort of in an Aristotelian type way, perhaps. You know, so, um, and finally, the very last thing. So. At one point in the semester some years ago, I was explaining all this and like, this is going to require your ability to think in terms of paradoxes and it's a totally different vista with respect to your, uh, your ability to think about anything. And one of my exasperated students said, well, you're asking us to think in ways that we've never even been told are possible, in parentheses, you bastard, <laughs> probably in her mind. And um, all I could say was like, yeah, you got it, man. That's it. That's it. This, this class is about learning to think in ways that you've never even been told are possible in the last approximately 15 years of your life, you know, in formal education. Okay, so welcome to the class, I guess in this fifth, fifth video. Uh, in the next video, we'll, take, we'll be taking up our first book as such. So this will end the getting started sort of... Uh, project and in the next um, video we'll be taking up uh, Rollo May's The Discovery of Being which is a really cool interesting book as Rollo May himself was a cool interesting person but at any rate I hope you have a great day and you can look forward with bated breath to the next video in this series. Take care. Bye-bye.